นะโมทัสสะภะคะวะโตอะระหะโตสัมมาสัมบุทธัสสะนะโมทัสสะภะคะวะโตอะระหะโตสัมมาสัมบุทธัสสะนะโมทัสสะภะคะวะโตอะระหะโตสัมมาสัมบุทธัสสะปุถังธรรมังสังขังนมัสสะมิโอ้ once again I'm very uh, glad indeed to see so many people gathered together on this uh, New Year's Eve here at Amravati. There are uh, uh, many different uh, New Years and uh, New Year's days in our calendar. The uh, the uh, traditional Buddhist uh, New Year comes on the full moon of November. That's when the Buddhist year changes. Um, at the end of the rainy season, we have this uh, Western calendar. Uh, the um, uh, December 31st, January 1st is the uh, the, the uh, global uh, Western calendar. Chinese New Year is uh, in the, on the full on the new moon of February, uh, and then you have a uh, Asian New Year in about April the 12th or 13th. So many many different uh, changes of year in our various calendars, but uh, this uh, is a. Um, Uh, whether we choose one day or another, uh, the uh, the coming of uh, a new year is a time for, say, considering what has gone before, and uh, say setting intentions for what will uh, come in the future. This is the customs that have occurred, established all around the world uh, for many many uh, years, centuries. The changing of the year, one uh, one year coming to an end and a new one beginning, it's a time to let go of what has uh, happened in the past, that which has been uh, painful and difficult, or uh, or is worn out and old, to leave that behind, and also to leave behind that which is good and beneficial, things that have been uh, helpful to us, to acknowledge those, to uh, to recognize those, but also to. To leave those behind too, whether something is sweet or bitter, wholesome or unwholesome, cherished or uncherished, then the uh, the changing of the year uh, reminds us that uh, life moves on in an inexorable and relentless way. Time keeps passing; the years keep coming and going. We all keep getting older. So uh, it's good to take this as a time to to look back. At uh, the uh, the uh, the previous year, the previous times, to see what have been uh, things that were difficult and painful, uh, uncomfortable, uh, and things that were beneficial and helpful and uh, and liberating. To consider those and, and to to learn from those. This last year, uh, 2022, has been a, a particular time for uh, letting go of the old here at Amravati. Those of you who are Residents or regular visitors will know that a large uh, uh, amount of the uh, uh, see uh, the buildings that have served us for so well for the last uh, 30, uh, 38 years or so since 1984 uh, have uh, been uh, taken down during this last year. The, The sala, which was uh, very much the center of community life, uh, the gathering place for the for the community and the kitchen there, and uh, many other facilities that were contained in the old sala, the library and the bodhi house that uh, many people had stayed in as guests and spent uh, very valuable times uh, here visiting and uh, being in retreat and so forth. They're all gone. <laughs> They're now. Uh, open ground and uh, in the process of being developed into into new uh, new spaces, new buildings, new facilities. The stupa that has uh, been out in the field for the last 20 years or so, uh, that uh, so we've taken that down to re rework the foundation, create a new foundation, create a, a new stupa uh, in the in the coming years. Um, So a, a lot of goodbyes, a lot of farewells to things that have been of great support, great benefit, uh, brought many blessings to us, 
but uh, uh, all good things come to an end, that the things uh, live out their lifespan. And uh, these uh, the wooden buildings that we inherited when the community moved here in 1984, they were originally constructed in 1939 uh, and designed to be a summer camp for you know, summertime use only. So they, they served us well, they served the evacuee children from London and during the Blitz in the Second World War, they served those children very well. They served uh, very well for St. Margaret's School that followed after the Second World War and they, they served us too. And, uh, and many of them still um, help and, and serve our community, but uh, they're extraordinarily energy inefficient and, uh, and hard to maintain so slowly, but surely we're uh, easing those out of commission and uh, constructing new uh, energy efficient and more purpose-built structures. We've also tried to recycle what we can of the old buildings. So lots of this beautiful uh, cedar wood, uh, originally from uh, uh, British Columbia in Canada, that was uh, used to make the, those summer camp huts. They have been uh, stacked up and recycled. All the, uh, the roofing sheets, the um, uh, some of the, the long beams and other timbers we've managed to stash away to, to reuse in the future. So when we let go of the old, we don't just sort of discard it completely, but we look and see, well, what can be retained? What has, uh, uh, yes, we, we no longer need the buildings as such, but what can we use? Uh, what's beneficial as um, uh, that's been part of that? What can we retain? Uh, looking back over the the uh, the past year and using the the time of uh, the uh, change from one year to another, uh, uh, the new year period, uh, and that process of considering the past uh, and learning from it what's been uh, be what's been beneficial, what's been harmful, what's been uh, say painful and difficult, what's been uh, liberating. This is, a, as I said, is, a, is an ancient process that's happened in, in many, many cultures and reflecting on this ending of the year. Today I was reminded of uh, about uh, 10 years ago in the spring of 2013, I had the opportunity to go to Mount Kailash in Tibet and uh, to make the, the pilgrimage uh, around the mountain. It's called the, the Kora, K-O-R-A, the Kora, making a, a, a journey around Mount Kailash. So as, as uh, some of you might know, Mount Kailash is a, a kind of um, a uniquely symmetrically shaped mountain, like a pyramid. It stands quite high in the in the eastern uh, in the western Himalayas, and it's also the the source of four of the great rivers of India. They all rise in that area: the Indus, the Sutlej the Brahmaputra and I think the, one of the branches of the Ganga, the river Ganges, all begin there at, at uh, uh, Mount Kailash. So it was known in the Buddha's time, it was called Kailasa Pabata uh, in the Buddha's time. And uh, it's, it's a sacred place of pilgrimage, both for the Hindu community and the Buddhist community. I think by following any of those rivers, you, you end up at Mount Kailash and it stands very high and is a uniquely symmetrical shape. Uh, they say that it's uh, the actual rock that Mount Kailash is made of is uh, of a, a, a somewhat different form from a lot of the, the landscape around it. And in ancient, ancient times, many millions of years ago, when that uh, part of, of Tibet, the Himalayas, was uh, under the, the what we call the Sea of Tethys in the ancient ancient times, then uh, Mount Kailash stood up as an island above the the Sea of Tethys in the the far ancient past. So it's a unique place and has been a place of pilgrimage for, as I said, for the the Buddhist and the Hindu community. And uh, Lumpur Sumato has made a, a couple of journeys there, uh, only managing once to get into Tibet. He got turned back at the border the first time. <laughs> uh, Achan Sujito and, and uh, uh, many other um, members of our community uh, over the, the years have made that pilgrimage. So I was very fortunate to be able to go in uh, 2013. And uh, uh, I was uh, picking Ajahn Sujito's brains a lot because he had a very inspiring but very challenging uh, 
uh, journey to, around Mount Kailash. Um, he'd done a certain amount of preparation, but wasn't quite ready for the amount of, of uh, uh, the impact that the high altitude and the lack of oxygen would have on his mental faculties and how it wasn't just a physical challenge, but also could be quite a mental challenge. And, and so uh, I wanted to, to find out what it was like, what he'd learned from that, that journey. And uh, one of the memorable stories he told me was, uh, speaking of the lack of mental faculties, he was, he was given a, a cup of, of soup. Um, and at that moment, he, uh, his brain stopped being able to comprehend what this was. He said, I know uh, I have to hold this in my hand and not spill it, but I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do with it. He said he sat there for about an hour with this cup in his hand, trying to remember, hmm, this, this liquid, this is a liquid, what do I do with this? And then it took him an hour to, to realize, oh, you put it in your mouth and drink it. Uh, so it's, the, 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 the mental faculties did come back <laughs> fully and completely. He's still a, a very, uh, very compass mentis. But he said the, the impact of the altitude and the... Um, lack of oxygen at about 5,000 meters. Uh, it's uh, quite, uh, quite high up. Uh, it, it had a, a very strong effect. So I took note of this, but also amongst the, uh, um, the physical challenges, he said there's uh, a system of contemplations that people do uh, uh, from the ancients of uh, uh, Tibetan customs and forms that people use when they make that journey around the, the sacred mountain, this sort of, uh, this kind of holy mountain, the way of reviewing your own life, reviewing your, your time time in the world and making great use uh, of that opportunity to be in such a, a unique and, and sort of uh, much beloved and respected place. It's also uh, many of the legends of Mount Sumeru, uh, Mount Sineru or Sumeru in the, in the Buddhist and Hindu legends as a sort of axis of the world, the kind of center point uh, of the world, uh, the, the, you know, the high mountain on which uh, on the top of which the um, the, uh, the heavenly realm of the Tavatinsa heaven is supposed to be situated above the, the top of the peak of the mountain. So, uh, and also uh, the top of the mountain is also supposed to be where Lord Shiva, according to Hindu legend, Lord Shiva lives on the top of Mount Kailash. So nobody's allowed to climb it. There's absolutely uh, no, no one gets permission to climb Mount Kailash. Yeah. Probably the, the, the um, uh, the fear of disturbing Lord Shiva in his meditation is not a thing you want to do. So, <laughs> so uh, the, um, the the system of reflections and con uh, contemplations that people would do around the mountain, I found very uh, very impactful, and so I, I noted all that down from Ajahn Sajito uh, before I went, and uh, just to. Uh, uh, to speak about this, I think it is quite relevant in terms of the ending of a year and contemplation of one's life, one's actions, and the effect of, of our choices, and then how to set a skillful direction for the future. So the pilgrimage around Mount Kailash starts off with a little village of Taksang in the south part of the mountain. And then there's a set a walking path um, around the mountain. Uh, we took about four days to make the journey. Some people do it in a single day. Uh, but um, there are certain points, uh, 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 sort of markers or, or significant points on the, 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 the route circling the mountain. So uh, the village of Taksang, Taksang, where you begin starts off, uh, and start off that it symbolizes the immeasurable past, the, uh, the uh, say the unnameable um, and uh, undefinable ancient past. As the Buddha said, there is no, no discoverable, no describable beginning to samsara. There's no way you can talk about time beginning or the universe uh, beginning. Uh, according to Buddhist mythology, the, the current universe as we experience it, this is just one in a long, long infinite series of universes that have come into being and have collapsed and have begun again. So. The, uh, the, the, the current Big Bang is just the, the, the most recent in a long, long series of Big Bangs and Big Crunches. Uh, 
the expansion and contraction of the universe. So uh, starting off from Taksang is like the back in the the un, uh, indescribable um, uh, origins of, of all things, and you set off on your journey. And then at a certain point, there's a, a small stupa, uh, a, a, a reliquary shrine that's got a, 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 a doorway on the, the south side and a doorway on the north side, uh, and as you and a bell <laughs> hanging in the, the middle as you as you go through. And uh, so, uh, as you're doing that first part of the journey from Taksang to this this first stupa. Uh, uh, that uh, in the, the what's called the, the area is called the Valley of the Gods. Then that's a time to contemplate all of the lives that have occurred before this one, both your own life, your own kind of karmic history of how many lives you've been through, but also uh, as human beings, our ancestors, our biological ancestors, our parents, grandparents, great great grandparents, and then back into our. Uh, animal history, biological history, all the way back to the uh, ancestors of the blue-green algae in the tide pools, you know, a, a, a billion or a couple of billion years ago, uh, at the beginnings of life on this planet. So it's a way of contemplating uh, this life as we experience it right now. Here we are, Amravati, 31st of December, 2022. This is uh, this day, this time, this life. This is just one in a, a long, 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 long series of lives. I, uh, uh, and you can see it through the lens of, uh, of an individual passing through a, a series of lifetimes, being born in various different circumstances, as female, as male, as an animal, as a bird, as a, as a fish, as a, a tall, short, uh, rich, poor, you know, uh, healthy, sick, uh, many, many, and various different circumstances that come with, with birth. But also that looking back to our ancestors, our parents, our grandparents, great grandparents, and so forth, recognizing that the life that we experience is the product of, of uh, thousands, millions of, of lives that have gone before that have, that have arrived here in, in this life. So, in a way, this is a, a contemplating what we experience as our life, my life, my body, my mind, my personality, my jobs, my, my story, where I live and uh, who I am, that is expanding the view that, well, what we, what we see now as our life, this is a very much a, a, a product of a vast range of forces, different events, different uh, factors that have all come together to make this. So it's a way of counteracting the illusion of independence, of individuality. Essentially, as we would say in Buddhist psychology, uh, cutting through self-view, sakaya ditti, learning to let go of that idea of you know, I am my body, I am my personality, I'm completely independent from everybody else, you know, I am this complete separate individual which can feel to be the case very easily, very often, but this way of, of uh, considering where we come from, our parents, their parents, their, their, uh, their parents and grandparents and all the way back, you know, how many lives have come together to make this life? Uh, and then in uh, previous lifetimes, who, you know, who we were in the life before this one and before that, before that, before that, before that, before that. I know that some people don't like the idea, even though it might be a dedicated Buddhist, don't like the idea of past lives and future lives. So <laughs> you can look at it, you, if that doesn't appeal to you and it doesn't seem realistic, you can leave that perspective aside. Just think in terms of our biological ancestry. But even that, I feel, is, is very, very worth considering. We, we can get so lost in this sense of you know, who we are, our personality, our story, our likes, our dislikes, our opinions. And they can be so real, so solid and so important. But to consider, well, I, I feel this way, I think this way, I have this language, I have this body, I have these, these uh, physical capacities and, and illnesses and so on. Because of everyone who's come before, those beings all the way back to the beginnings of the, the human world, you know, about quarter of 200,000, quarter of a million, 300,000 years ago, Homo sapiens, sapiens arising in Africa, before that, before that, before that, you know, to uh, the ancient biological past. We wouldn't be here if it wasn't for that development of life. The human species wouldn't have arisen if it hadn't been for all those other 
beings in the physical world. So as you are in that first part of the journey to consider, and looking back over this last year, to expand the view beyond our own personal concerns, our own personal, you know, the, the job that we have, the exams we got to pass, the people that live next door, the, the, um, uh, the age we have, the, the, uh, the, the worries we have, the, the things that we're proud of, our possessions, to broaden the view, to expand the view and to, to look at what we are, where we come from in a, I mean, a much broader way. Then the next part of the pilgrimage around the mountain, having gone through that little gateway in the Valley of the Gods, then you make your way up to what is called the Shiva Tsal, or the, the kind of the grounds of Shiva. And that is reflecting upon the events and actions of this life. Uh, say going through that little that little stupa is like our birth into this lifetime, this personality, this body, and then the shiv, to the shiva tsal is this lifetime, and so that uh, on the that this hillside uh, as the, the land starts to to rise up to the the high pass, there's this kind of uh, a, a rocky slope, and many many people have piled up rocks, made little stupas, little cans of stones, and leaving precious things there, uh, precious offerings. So that as you get to the Shiva Tsal, then you're considering what has happened in this life. What has been uh, skillfully done, what has been unskillfully done. What has, uh, what has happened to me that has been done by others that was painful and, and uh, I'm still carrying around with, with resentment and negativity. What have others uh, uh, given to me that has been so precious, so beautiful, so wonderful. So in that stretch of the pilgrimage, to uh, and as we can look back over this year, say, so what ha has happened in this year? That I feel uh, about my own actions. I feel, uh, uh, I feel regret about what have I said, what have I done? That I, when I think of it, I think, oh, that wasn't very beautiful. <laughs> that wasn't very helpful. That was really cruel. That wasn't very honest. So not to again feed self view, but to recognise. If there is uh, ignorance, if we don't see clearly, then we make mistakes, we, we say foolish things, we act in ways that are, are guided by greed or hatred and delusion. And so we acknowledge the unskillful things that we've said or done and recognize that the regret, the, the feeling of remorse that arises from that and say, well, there's the cause, there's the effect. So we learn from the painful results of unskillful actions that, that have been, uh, that we've carried out. Similarly, uh, reflecting on the, this, uh, this lifetime, on this, and in, uh, and in this last year in this instance, what are the things that we've done that we feel glad about? We're really pleased that we made that effort. We were generous to this person or very uh, kind or unselfish to acknowledge the skillful actions that we've carried out, the beautiful things that we've said, the way we've helped each other, the, the things that we've shared, the times when we've um, have, have uh, offered our assistance, our, our help to those around us. That you know, why should I have everything? Why, can, why shouldn't I just share it out? Why shouldn't I help others? What can I do to make my uh, my, uh, my friends, my family, the people around me, uh, and make their lives better? What can I do to help them? So to to look back and to acknowledge the the things that we've done that have been uh, beneficial. Again, not to feed self view and to be proud. Like, I did some really great stuff. I should be rewarded. You know, <laughs> I, I'm really a great person. But rather to rejoice in the good that has been done. When someone makes an offering uh, to support the community, we say anumotana. Uh, that's the way we respond. It's our sort of customary uh, Pali words that we use for accepting an offering. Satu anumotana. Satu, it is well, it is good. Anumotana, I rejoice in the good that has been done. So that look back, looking back over this year, or in that, that uh, part of that pilgrimage, looking out, looking back over the whole lifetime, to be ready to rejoice in the good that has been done, not to be proud or inflated, but to say, yeah, I'm really glad I did that. That was, that was a beautiful thing to have brought into the world. Yes, 
and to recognize the, the glow in the heart, the, the warmth in the heart that comes from skillful action. To uh, then also uh, consider uh, what others have done in your life that have been cruel or painful, the things that have been said or done to you that you feel resentful of, negative ways that people have hurt you, either family members or people that uh, you, you were in school with or people you work with or people in governments and people uh, around the world in the roles of leadership and power, power and authority who've misused that and caused hurt and pain. To, to look at that, those uh, painful actions, the negative, unskillful actions of others, the way it's impacted your own life, and to be ready to forgive. And coming to, to the Shiva Tzal is, say, uh, in the series of contemplations is up to the ending of this life until your last breath. What do you want to be carrying? If you've had resentment towards your parents or to an ex-partner or to some a school teacher or people who, uh, were, were, uh, who injured you or harmed you or, or, or made your life uh, a misery, do you want to still be carrying them around <laughs> at the end of this life? Uh, it's an opportunity to, to recognize, yeah, that was unskillful, that was painful to deal with, but do I have to carry it around? Do I need to, to nurse this resentment or can I forgive? I don't, I'm not glad that they treated me so badly. I'm not glad that these people have caused so much harm in the world, causing misery and, and misuse of resources and warfare, causing, destroying the lives of others. I'm not glad that people have done that, but I don't have to carry around hatred. As the, the Lord Buddha said in the Dhammapada, hatred is never conquered by hatred. Hatred is only ever conquered by love. This is the law, ancient and inexhaustible. So uh, at the ending of this year, just as so in that contemplation coming up to the Shiva Tzal, to uh, recollect the, um, the harm and painful things that have been done to you and, and your loved ones uh, by others, and to be ready to forgive, to let go, to, to uh, not bear grudges. And then the last kind of contemplation I like to suggest, and as part of this reflection, is to consider how others have helped you. Your teachers, your parents, the, the people in the, uh, uh, in the world around you, other family members or people that you work with, people in society, who've made the effort uh, to, to bring blessings into your life. And, that quality of gratitude. Yes, I'm so grateful I had these wonderful people to be a, a, an example, to be my helpers, to be my teachers, to show me a, a skillful direction. Satu, wonderful, how marvelous. So to rejoice in the good that has been uh, done and offered to support us, so that that's a way of bringing to mind and, and delighting, not to create a sense of debt or, you know, I've, uh, these people help me so much, therefore I, I owe them. <laughs> and uh, a kind of stressful burden on the heart of, oh, I've got to pay back all the good that's been done to me, but rather to, uh, to rejoice in the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the good that others have, have uh, brought into your life. I remember once, uh, many, many years ago, I was trying to explain Buddhism to my mother, and uh, not very well. <laughs> she was a bit resistant because of just the fact that Buddhism was what had taken her son away, quote unquote. <laughs> so it was a bit of a bit of uh, a bit of a fence to climb. <laughs> but I was trying to convince her of some really uh, good Buddhist principles, uh, and so I thought, well, this uh, this the, the words about the um, uh, about the repayment of, of the debt of gratitude that we owe to our parents. I thought, well, that'll impress her. So I said, you know, the Buddha said that, you know, you, um, that uh, the, uh, your parents are uh, incredibly important people in your lives and that uh, it's, it's very, very difficult to repay the debt of gratitude that uh, you owe to your parents for all the work, the effort and, and uh, the um, energy and uh, care that they put into to bringing you into the world, to educating you, looking after you. And my mother was not impressed. She said, why do you call it a debt? That's really stupid. Is that... <laughs> 
Why, why do you call it a debt? So having uh, you having your children, uh, myself and my two sisters. So, yeah, having your children and bringing you up—that was the most wonderful thing that's happened in my life. Why call it a debt? That's really idiotic. But, okay. <laughs> So, okay, well, thank you. That's uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, maybe debt is not quite the right word. <laughs> so I think the uh, it's a strength of relationship, and uh, I would say that that uh, a quality of appreciation is probably a better way of describing it rather than a debt that one owes. But uh, um, the the word uh, katanyu is. Uh, uh, is translated as gratitude. It comes from the Pali uh, kata, which means which means to do, uh, the verb to do, and anyu to know. So knowing what has been done, katanyu, uh, acknowledging or, or knowing, appreciating what has been done, and then katavedi is that's often translated as the the debt of gratitude. But katavedi is. Uh, the feeling, like Vedi of Katavedi is is from Vedana, feeling, the feeling of what has been done. So that kind of the heartfelt appreciation of like, yes, I, f I feel that uh, the beauty of what has been given, I feel that, I, I acknowledge that. So uh, I would suggest that debt is not a, an ideal word to use in English, but since that, that, that the feeling of appreciation, the heartfelt appreciation for the goodness that we have received, uh, and to rejoice in that, to, to delight in, in the, the good that others have, have done, and uh, uh, to bring blessings into our lives. So then from the, the next part of the pilgrimage around Kailash is from the Shiva Tsal, where uh, it's like, as I said, it's uh, that, the, the, that field of st the small stupas and cairns uh, where people leave offerings. It's uh, something that is uh, traditionally, pr uh, what is, what is uh, given there, something that is very precious to you, very personal and very important to symbolize the end of this life, you leave it behind. And so, um, uh, well, I made this pilgrimage in 2013, and one of the things that I had inherited from um, my my mother and father, and then they, they both died, um, was uh, the the watch that my mother gave my father on their wedding day. I had my dad's watch with me, and so I thought, well, that represents uh, their love for each other. And it's a sort of family heirloom, and it also represents where me and my sisters biologically came from. <laughs> and so I had my, my dad's watch, and so I put it, we made this little stone stupa, and I put uh, the, the watch that my mother gave my father on their wedding day into that little stupa. And uh, Ajahn Damarako, uh, as he was then, was all sort of part of the pilgrimage. And uh, uh, before he was a monk, he was a, he, uh, was a layman, and... Uh, uh, he and his family uh, lived near Chithurst uh, for a long time, and they used to bring their their two daughters, uh, Rachel and Hannah, uh, to the monastery. And uh, Hannah very tragically died in a strange uh, explosion. She was in a in a car that uh, parked at uh, Chithurst that, that blew up, and uh, she very tragically died just about the age of two uh, on an uh, ordination day in 1983. And I think it was also Lumpur Sumedho's birthday, uh, so it was a very, very tragic occurrence. And so uh, Ajahn Damaraka had brought his little two-year-old daughter's uh, address of hers that he brought with him. And we also put the dress, Hannah's little dress, in the, in the stupa. And then it was a very powerful feeling, putting these precious articles, these very precious items to, uh, into a can, into a little stupa, and then walking away leaving it behind like as if it's the the end of the life so um, along with with uh, uh, the um, the letting go of things mentally it's also good uh, uh, at the end of a year no, I'm not suggesting you leave your valuables here <laughs> but uh, to consider, okay, what what are the precious things that I keep really close that are, are really mine and really sort of represent me and my life and my family and my the things that are most dear, 
am I ready to leave those behind and, and walk away? You know, because when the last breath comes, we breathe, we breathe out, and we don't breathe in again. Then everything material gets left behind, and so this the the uh, that part of the pilgrimage around Mount Kailash is a way of bringing that home, bringing that to heart. Like yes, that which is most precious, most dear, most personal. All of it is left behind. It's uh, anything material is uh, is is uh, impossible to take with you. So that was a very powerful moment, and also the air is getting very thin at this point, <laughs> climbing up higher and higher uh, towards the the, Dol the Dolmala Pass, which is the highest point around Mount Kailash. <laughs> and the uh, so that the. Uh, the air is very, very thin, and so I would be able to walk about 15 or 20 paces, and then I'd have to stop and take a breather. <sighs> and uh, and uh, you can't just sort of push through, you know, you can't just say, I'll just keep going, I don't need to stop for a break. The body says, oh yes, you do. <laughs> but your, your brain might say one thing, but the body is saying, nope. <laughs> we need to stop, get more oxygen, and then you can go. So there's a lot of stopping and starting steadily uh, up to the uh, the top, uh, so that the uh, that section of the pilgrimage from the the Shiva Tsal all the way up to the top of the pass, then that's uh, a, a, a contemplating the the dying process, like the life having ended, this life having come to an end. What is still lingering? Are there still opinions, memories, uh, personal qualities that? The orchestra of phones. <laughs> the, uh, the, what, what is the mind still hanging on to? And then uh, uh, as you going up the last uh, uh, stretch as it, you know, with each step getting uh, a little more difficult, a little more challenging, then ideally by the time you get to the top of the pass, the Dolmala Pass, which is completely covered in prayer flags, it's just a kind of riot of colour is a, of, uh, yellow and white and red and blue and green prayer flags all kind of blasting in the wind. Um, by the time you get to the top of the pass, then everything ideally has been let go of. <laughs> not just material things, not just your body, not just your personality, all of your opinions, your memories, your uh, the um, the kind of all of the personal attachments, uh, at least according to the contemplation, have been abandoned by the point where you get to the top of the pass, and then it's literally downhill from there on. So the contemplation is then from all the way down from the Dolmala Pass all the way through back to Taksan, at the south end of the uh, of the Kora, the the pilgrimage route. Uh, it's the uh, life uh, in the embodiment of the clear light nature of mind. So life uh, in the, uh, uh, continuing, uh, there being you know, the mind awake, aware, but all uh, personal attachments, uh, all identifications and and uh, graspings have been let go of. So it's uh, living in the uh, and embodying the clear light nature of mind, the pabasara jitta. That's the ideal. And physically, it, it, it literally is downhill from there on. So, so whereas every, uh, on the way up to the Dolmala Pass, is literally every, every step is a challenge. And, and uh, I had to stop every you know, 10, 15, 20 paces at least. Uh, once we reached the top, I, I was, uh, my feet were flying <laughs> down, the, down the other side of the mountain. It was a very different experience. So I thought, this is a very brilliant kind of contemplation because the, the, the topography, the shape of the land actually encourages that same, you know, uh, when all uh, attachments have been let go of, there's a genuine quality of physical ease and freedom and, and downhill from here on. <laughs> So that was a, a, um, a, a very, I thought, a very impactful and beautiful part of the contemplation. So at the end of the year, uh, uh, as we say, look at um, things we regret, things that we're pleased about in our own conduct, things that we resent from others, and things we are appreciative of in others, to bring those things to mind, to, to bring those contemplations to mind, and to let go of it all. Let go of the, the, the negative and the painful, let go of the, the positive and the de delightful, um, 
to uh, to acknowledge uh, that, to learn from all of that, and to let go, to uh, embody that clear light nature of mind, the pabasara jitta. Uh, <coughs> the even though that's a, a, a term used in the Tibetan tradition, it's also uh, from the Pali. Papasara means means light or brightness, uh, radiance, and um, the uh, one of the um, the favourite teachings of Lumpo Sumedha, one of the, the most uh, frequently quoted passages from the suttas that, that Lumpo Sumedha would refer to, um, was the um, uh, uh, a description of the the mind that is free of all clinging, which is you find in a couple of different suttas, um, where it says uh, vinya is called. Uh, the, it describes this nature of mind as vinyanang anidasanang anantang sabato pabang. The, the mind, the, the consciousness, the awareness, which is uh, formless, which uh, which has, which is invisible, formless, um, non-manifest, uh, ananta, in, uh, infinite, uh, limitless, uh, sabato pabang, radiant in all directions, and that uh, that uh, the, when the Buddha speaks of this nature of mind, this this quality of the awake, aware mind. He says that it doesn't provide a landing place for long and short, for coarse and fine, for pure and impure, for uh, any of our, those regular dualities. So um, it doesn't mean to say we can't tell between left and right <laughs> or up and down. Uh, that would be very impractical and hard to live that way. But what it's talking about is when that uh, everything has been let go of, in terms of a uh, personal attachment and grasping, then the heart can live in a in a completely responsive way. We can uh, can relate to uh, praise and criticism, gain and loss, uh, comfort and discomfort, health and sickness, uh, fame and disrepute. It can relate to all of those different aspects of our lives with a great evenness and. Uh, a, uh, a, a great quality of, uh, of harmony, of attunement to the time, the place, the situation. Letting go of the, the year that's gone by and having learnt from, lessons from it, uh, entering into the, the new year, then uh, I feel this is a, a very a skillful way of establishing the attitude to let go, uh, to learn from the past and to use it to let go of all attachments, to encourage us to live in a way that is completely open-hearted, to embody that clear light nature of mind, the, the pabasara citta, the mind which is awake, aware, and uh, attuned to all situations. So it doesn't mean to say that when we are criticized we like it, it's still bitter, but we don't re react in a negative way. We don't can just shut that out or, or, or argue back or, or defend ourselves, but recognize, oh, well, that uh, th those words that I said there, they, they didn't please that person, or that for some reason that person doesn't like me, doesn't like the way I look, or doesn't approve of my accent, or... <laughs> Or some choice that I've made. Okay, that's their business. Um, what's to be learned from that? Or if people praise you, they say, oh, this is so wonderful, this is so great, you're so fantastic, it's so lovely to have you working here, or you know, sharing the, this, uh, being in the same class as you, sharing the, the workspace with you, being in the family with you. And then, again, to relate to that, not that, oh, I'm so good, I'm so wonderful, people really love me, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> to get drunk on that uh, approval, but rather, okay, well, this, what I said, that uh, has been pleasing. People have approved of that. That's uh, kind of having a, 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 a beneficial result. Okay, well, what can be learned from that? So uh, the many and various lives that are gathered here uh, at Amravati this evening and coming to the, the end of this year, seeing out the, the year together, then uh, I heartily encourage us to, to look back, to, to consider what has gone before, to, uh, to use those kind of contemplations, to appreciate the good that's been done, uh, to learn from the, the painful things that have been done uh, by us or to us, and to uh, to take that the lessons that are learned from all of that 
to establish the heart in that that clarity, that quality of of uh, attunement to the time, the place, the situation, so that uh, we can live responsively rather than reactively, so that uh, when we are praised, we don't get drunk on it. When we are criticized, we don't get uh, intimidated or embittered. Um, if things go well, again, we don't get carried away by that. And if things go badly, we don't get carried away by that either. But we, we learn from these various different circumstances. Uh, at the ending of a year, the beginning of a new year, it's quite customary to make New Year's resolutions. Uh, I can't read people's minds, so I'm sure we each know the, the, the areas where we get lost, get carried away, and those, those foolish and regrettable things get said and done. <laughs> but uh, if you're thinking, oh, he knows. No, no I don't. <laughs> it's just... Uh, the, that's the way we are as human beings. So we, uh, we we make mistakes. We say foolish things. We do foolish things. We get distracted. We get lazy. We get selfish. We get irritated. We get confused. And so, foolish things get said and, and get done. And the Buddha understood this. This is the way we are as human beings. But we can learn from that. We can. We don't have to be that way. So at this time, uh, it's, to, it's good to consider, okay, where are the areas where I keep crashing the same car, <laughs> where I keep making the same mistakes? Uh, where, where, where is that? And to let that be acknowledged rather than letting the mind go into making excuses or, oh, I'm just going to always be like that, I just, uh, I, I give up. They, no, <laughs> look, <laughs> this is done, this is the painful result. Here's the cause, here's the effect. Ow! Just to let that, that painful effect, let the, the cut on you to know the feeling, <laughs> to, to let that feeling be known, and to let that uh, be a, a way of guiding a skillful uh, path forwards. That, uh, okay. If this is done, then that's got this painful result. The more that pain is genuinely felt and acknowledged, then the, the more possible it is to not be following that, that path, not to continue to go down that, that track in the future. So we, we look at our mistakes, our, our errors, where we get lost. Again, not to create self-criticism, self-hatred, or I'm a terrible person, I'm so awful, how could I do that? But rather to, to let that mistake, that those errors be fully known, and then acknowledging that, knowing that, feeling that, then letting that guide skillful action in the future. As the, the Buddha said over and over again when talking about uh, discipline and uh, behavior, he said, to recognize our transgressions as such and to endeavor to do better in the future, this is called bhavana, this is called development in this dhamma and discipline. That's how we improve. The Buddha never assumed that we would never make mistakes. <laughs> uh, he didn't expect his disciples to always have perfect conduct, but he expected us to, to make mistakes, but to take the opportunity to learn from those mistakes and to guide our lives in a more skillful direction uh, in the future. So I warmly, heartily encourage us to, to look over our last year, or the, or the, the rest of the earlier part of our lives, <laughs> to, uh, to look at that, to, to recognize what has been beneficial, what's been helpful, what's been harmful, what's been painful, to let those le lessons really sink in, both the, the owl of the unskillful and the, oh yes, the glow of the skillful, and let, and let those have their effect, let those feelings be known, the cut on you, let the, let the feelings be known, and let those be the teacher. And then as the, the year turns, uh, let that be what helps to set skillful action in place for the coming year, 2023. So uh, I offer these thoughts for consideration this evening. So this evening uh, we'll 
have a meditation vigil. People are welcome to uh, sit here in the temple or go and do a, a walking meditation outside. Uh, it's a bit of a uh, rainy evening, uh, at least it was <laughs> earlier on. But uh, please do feel welcome to come and go. If you have got phones, please make sure they're switched off. <laughs> The ringers are switched off uh, if you are sitting in here and please uh, do come and go as uh, quietly as you can. It's now uh, just about 9.30. At 11.30 in two hours time then we'll um, um, begin the Parita chanting. This is our, our Parita means protection. So these are the traditional verses that we recite for blessing and protection. It's a way of saying farewell to the old year and, and welcome to the new year. And so that will uh, carry on for half an hour and then that will finish uh, at midnight. And then um, the, uh, those who wish, then uh, there should be refreshments available over in the uh, the sala opposite the um, the kitchen, and so that uh, after midnight has come and the new year has arrived, then those who wish can uh, have some hot chocolate and such like, uh, non-alcoholic refreshments. <laughs> but you, you knew that already, <laughs> um, and uh, so that uh, this is a, I feel a very delightful and and uh, skillful way to bring the new year in and to. Uh, whether you're driving uh, now or you're uh, going later on, then please do um, drive carefully on the road and, don't, uh, and uh, uh, don't assume that everyone on the road with you is sober because uh, a lot of people are consuming a, a lot of alcohol on the New Year's Eve so that uh, if you are on the road, do, do keep your eyes extra wide open and uh, look out for your fellow travellers because they might not have all their faculties fully sharpened and aware uh, on this uh, this night uh, so uh, enjoy the rest of the evening <laughs> <laughs>